Back in May, I did an analysis of Silent Hill 4 The Room. In that video, I tried to clearly explain why that game had such a divisive reception relative to the first three games. To outline my argument, I compared Silent Hill 4 to other divisive games in other franchises. The common factor that I deduced from all of them is that they deviated from the core gameplay formula that people had grown to love. When core elements of a game's identity are changed, there is a significant chance that people will be split over whether the changes are positive and progressive, or violate the true spirit of what that franchise is. Sometimes this isn't the case, like with Resident Evil 4, a game that is very different from its predecessors, but is generally considered one of the greatest games ever made, and is in line with the overall franchise's core identity. Then there's a game like Silent Hill 4, whose changes are enough to make some people call it the best in the series, and some to call it the beginning of the end for the franchise. Who is right, and who is wrong? What is quintessential to a franchise's identity and should never be changed, and what is okay to change? And are there times where a change needs to be made for the health of the franchise, even if it will make millions upset? There is no universally applicable answer to this question. That said, I would like to entertain a utilitarian answer. Not accept, but entertain. If you can't find universal agreement on what's okay to change and what's not, the only thing that is left to do is make the best game you can. You can commit a lot of sins against a franchise's identity, but if the game has great gameplay, a great story, graphics, music, and everything else, then a sizable portion of the audience will either ignore those sins or live with them. To test this theory, I will cite another game from the Silent Hill franchise. Back in July, I did a poll of my audience asking which of the Western Silent Hill games were the best, that being the ones post Silent Hill 4. And overwhelmingly, the winner was Silent Hill Shattered Memories. This is a curious result, because Shattered Memories is by far the biggest departure from what I believe is the franchise's core identity. When I and other people think of Silent Hill, things that often come to mind are blood-soaked and decrepit environments, various monster designs with deep symbolic meaning, and survival-based gameplay that is made even more difficult by limited supplies and restrictive controls. Almost none of this exists in Shattered Memories, and honestly, the lack of those things detracts significantly from my enjoyment of the game. But that said, many of the new things that are added are so good, so progressive, and so in keeping with Silent Hill's core identity that they help me ignore some of those faults. I'll go even further. Some of the things this game does are so innovative, the fact that they haven't been used in more horror games since its release is borderline criminal. In honor of Spooktober and the new Silent Hill games coming out, if they're still coming out, that is, I would like to look back at what I believe is the most underappreciated Silent Hill game to see what it got so right, as well as what it got wrong, and what future games can learn from what this game accomplished. Before I do, I will say, happily, that this video features no story spoilers, so you can safely watch this video and then go play the game if you haven't already. To begin, I believe it will serve us well to look at a bit of development history. Doing this will not only help us understand why the game turned out the way it did, but also inform this video's central thesis regarding franchise identity and what is okay to change. Following the release of Silent Hill 4 in 2004, Konami made the executive decision to move development of future Silent Hill titles to the West, where they felt the game had a larger potential audience. The first title to be released in this new era was Silent Hill Origins in 2007, developed by the UK-based Climax Studios. Though neither Konami nor Climax were completely satisfied with the financial success or critical reception of Origins, the result was good enough to greenlight another title from that same studio. This next game, however, would have to do something innovative to reignite interest in the IP. 
After all, sales and critical reception have been consistently dipping ever since the first two games. Former lead designer at Climax, Sam Barlow, had some reasonable ideas to address this decline. He knew from the relative beginning that to increase sales, the next game would be released on the Nintendo Wii, which was by far the most successful game console at the time. Plus, the interactivity of the Wii's motion controls could potentially introduce a new dimension of horror to the world of gaming. As for what creative direction the new title would take, well, that took a lot of time to flesh out. Barlow described the early days of Shattered Memories development as meandering. Several ideas were thrown out for what would follow Silent Hill Origins. An America-based producer for Silent Hill, William Mortell, wanted to make a Wii-based first-person shooter spin-off of Silent Hill. It would be called Brahms PD, worst title ever, and would follow an amnesiac police officer trying to find his partner. When this idea didn't impress Konami's executives, Climax came up with a pitch for a game called Silent Hill Cold Heart. The game's hook would have been its unique spin on Silent Hill's classic survival gameplay. It would remove the classic fog worlds and bloody other worlds of Silent Hill and replace them with a world of ice and cold. The main character, a traumatized university student named Jessica, would need to scavenge for clothes and supplies in order to survive a Silent Hill which would randomly dip below sub-zero temperatures. Unfortunately, making these kinds of radical changes to Silent Hill's classic imagery and gameplay made it difficult for Cold Heart to get Konami's approval. At first, thankfully for Climax, they, by random chance, found their golden ticket to getting the project going. Prior to Shattered Memory's development, Barlow said that a Climax employee noticed something that a Konami executive had said on a global database of theirs. That employee said that the idea of a Silent Hill 1 remake was something that Konami would greenlight. So all Barlow would have to do is say that their new game was that, and they would be good to go. Climax then took all the best ideas from Brahms PD and Cold Heart, and then mixed them with character names and locations from the first Silent Hill game. The result was Silent Hill Shattered Memories. It should be noted though that outside of those similarities, Shattered Memories has very little in common with the first Silent Hill game. Yes, the beginning of both games features a protagonist named Harry driving with his daughter Cheryl, and then the car crashes near the town of Silent Hill. Harry wakes up to find that his daughter had disappeared, and then he attempts to find her. After that, though, the similarities become almost non-existent. This convinces me beyond a shadow of a doubt that calling Shattered Memories a remake of Silent Hill 1 was more to get a project greenlit at Climax rather than to actually provide a faithful recreation. While this was disappointing in and of itself, it is somewhat irrelevant to the central thesis of this video. The question is whether or not Silent Hill Shattered Memories is a good game or a bad game, and whether or not it is in keeping with Silent Hill's core identity. Let's shift back to that discussion by looking at the core idea that carried over from Brahms PD into Shattered Memories. Any discussion of Shattered Memories' strengths must begin with its central feature, its psychological profiling system. Right when you boot up the game, a red screen with white text tells you that the game collects data on the way you play, and then uses that data to shape the world of Silent Hill into something that will more likely terrify that particular gamer. Now the way this is done can be boiled down into two categories. First, throughout the game you will engage in seven therapy sessions with a psychologist named Dr. K. He will ask you to complete a series of questionnaires and tests, all of which are actually based off of tests that actual psychologists use every day. The answers you give, according to Climax's developers, affects 25% of the game's presentation and outcomes. The other 75% depends on player behavior during the rest of the game. The game tracks what things you look at and for how long. Do you go through the game fast, or do you like to explore your environment? Do you look at your map a lot, and do you mark your map to help you on your journey? Even which rooms you decide to go into will affect things. In other words, don't go into the women's bathroom. 
you know, whether it's in real life or the game. Yeah, I'm talking to you who played the game back in the day. Yeah, sure you were doing it because you were looking for collectibles. Yeah, sure, sure. The combination of these two factors changes various things, including character behavior and clothing, story outcomes, which include but are certainly not limited to the ending, what types of monsters you see, and what puzzles you can do. Now due to the fact that this psychological profiling mechanic was relatively new at the time, its deepness and effectiveness will vary. To test how deep and effective the profiling system could be, I did two playthroughs of this game. The first time around, I answered all the psychologist's questions honestly, and then played the game as morally as I would any other game. On the second playthrough, I gave the opposite answers to all the psychologist's questions, and tried to do the inverse of whatever I did outside of the therapy sessions. For research, some of the changes that worked included the way characters dressed, and the way they acted be it on their own or interacting with others. The first time around, the characters were behaved and dressed modestly, while the second time around, they were more extroverted and flirtatious. The environment and lore items would change in effective ways as well. For example, throughout the game you have random messages pop up on your phone that reveal the past lives of Silent Hill's denizens, be it your own or those of others. One message I picked up in the first playthrough was of a guy lightly coaxing his girlfriend to have intercourse, while the same message in the second playthrough featured dialogue where the guy was being more forceful. There are enough dynamic changes like this that it not only makes the profiling system feel truly reactive, but also more disturbing than I expected. Where other games would remind you of your decisions, good or bad, in explicit ways, Shattered Memories reminding you of your decisions in subtle ways genuinely got under my skin in a few instances. And I say that as somebody who rarely gets scared or disturbed by horror media. That said, the system is not without its problems. Some of the changes are completely meaningless. In one of the therapy sessions, you can color in a picture of a house. The scene that follows this session will feature a house and a couple whose clothes reflect the colors you chose to draw with. Stuff like this doesn't really add anything to the overall experience. My biggest criticism, however, and I say this with a heavy heart, is the way this system affects the creature design in the game. Compared to all the past Silent Hill games which have a variety of creature types, Shattered Memories only has one, the Rorschachs. Get it? It's a play on the word Rorschach, as in Rorschach test. Get it? I don't like you. Okay. These Rorschachs will have their appearance shift according to your interactions with the psychologist and the environment. So for example, if you look at the alcohol behind Dr. K a lot while you're talking to him, the monsters will then begin to look bloated and diseased. While the idea of a monster's shape reflecting your unconscious actions is very cool in theory, I don't think the technology was sophisticated enough at the time to pull it off. Plus, not only are the subtle differences in their appearance minimal and devoid of much meaning, it's difficult to observe them. These monsters will only show up 20% of the time during your playthrough, when the town temporarily transitions into the other world, which is no longer covered in blood and rust, but in ice and snow. By the way, I don't know about you, but ice isn't scary. Then again, I'm Canadian, so ice to me is like cobras to this guy. Anyways, when the monsters show up, you're not able to fight them like you can in every other Silent Hill game. You can only run away from them, which puts them behind you and out of sight most of the time. And when you can't see them, you're more concerned with trying to get them off your back than you are with the way they look. And this brings me to my biggest criticism of Shattered Memories. These chase sequences. So, in every other Silent Hill game, you will constantly be stuck in tight corridors with a variety of terrifying monsters, and a limited set of resources to help you survive. If you die, and you haven't saved often, you risk being set back a long period of time. This choice of gameplay design promotes great feelings of claustrophobia and tension, combined with the natural anxiety that comes with resource management. 
All of that is gone in Silent Hill Shattered Memories. You can't fight, you can only run away, and sometimes hide. Which, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to work very often. If the raw shocks catch you, you can use the Wii's motion controls to try and get them off your back. Although depending on your controller's functionality, the struggle could quickly turn from one of fear to one of frustration. The combination of these factors, the lack of monster variation, the fact that the monsters only show up 20% of the time exclusively in the other world, and the fact you can't fight them, make Shattered Memories largely devoid of the fear that characterized past Silent Hill games. Granted, the idea of being chased will be scary to some people, but honestly, how consistently scary are those sequences going to be over the course of the game? Especially when you don't even die if you fail a chase sequence, but just get set back a minute or two. With this sentiment being expressed, it might be difficult for some people to understand why I still hold this game in such high regard, if it's mostly not scary. Here's how I would respond to that confusion. The most beloved Silent Hill games were largely influenced by horror movies like The Shining, directed by Stanley Kubrick, and disturbing psychological thrillers like Lost Highway, directed by David Lynch. Where Shattered Memories fails at capturing that Kubrick-type horror, it succeeds to a greater degree at capturing that Lynchian style. Like with Lost Highway or many of David Lynch's other films, Shattered Memories won't necessarily scare you, but it will make you feel unsettled. With every level or cutscene, there will always be something that feels off, that feels uncanny. This is largely due to the changes made by the profiling system, but also due to the hammy acting and creepy music, which are also trademark tools of Lynch's films that are used to disorient the audience. All of these uncanny elements are there to make the audience suspect that the reality we are observing is a false one, and that the actual reality will reveal itself to those that pay attention. This is Silent Hill in a nutshell a symbolic world that hints at a horrifying reality beneath the surface, and Shattered Memories captures that original Silent Hill-type feel in the keenest possible way. In fact, I would say that the last hour of the game, where reality truly begins to break apart and a horrifying truth begins to reveal itself, measures up to some of the greatest, most disturbing parts of the original Silent Hill games. I don't know how to describe it except that that last hour made me feel like I was home again. In a sea of mediocre western Silent Hill games, that last hour felt like a flawless diamond in the rough. So, despite the fact that Shattered Memories abandoned Silent Hill's core identifiers with its world design, the variety of creatures, the combat, and for myself, the scariness, the feelings of unease and mystery are as strong and, in some respects, stronger than they have ever been. Add in a variety of puzzles that are fun and not at all frustrating like the ones in past games, as well as a powerful and very emotional reveal to the underlying mystery, and you got a game that, I believe, maintains the spirit of what Silent Hill is. Though the sum of Shattered Memories' parts is not enough for me to classify it as a great game, and it's far from the completeness of the original three, it is enough for me to view it as a good game, and worthy of the Silent Hill brand. If this video made you inclined to check out Silent Hill Shattered Memories, make sure to hit that like button. It's free and it helps out my channel a lot. If you want to emulate Shattered Memories, I will leave a link to an emulation tutorial in the description box below. I will also list the settings I used, which I would highly recommend you use as well, because it took me a while to make the game work without frame rate slowdown or graphical issues. That does it for me, here's to the beginning of Spooktober everybody. Expect much more horror related content in the coming weeks. Until next time, remember to stay safe and stay out of the women's bathroom, Harry, you f***ing psycho.